arrested for people here illegally. Governor Christie has said of you, as soon as you felt the heat, you turn tail and run. Governor Bush has said, I don't think we need people cutting and running anymore. Did you fight for your own legislation, Senator, or did you run from it? Here's the bottom line. We can't get that legislation passed. The American people will not support doing anything about people that are in this country illegally until the law is enforced first and you prove it to them. This has been abundantly clear. Every effort over the last 10 years to do those comprehensively has failed. And it has failed because the American people have zero trust that the federal government will enforce our laws. And that's why since then I have said repeatedly, if you are serious about immigration reform, then the key that unlocks the door to being able to do that is not just to pass a law that says it's going to enforce the law, but to actually do it. To hire the 20,000 new border agents, to finish the fencing and walls, to put in place mandatory E-Verify, to put in place an entry exit tracking system to prevent visa overstays. And once that's in place and that's working, I believe the American people will support a very reasonable but responsible approach to people that have been here a long time, who are not dangerous criminals, who pay taxes and pay fines for what they did. But until then, none of that is going to be possible. But I'm asking, did you fight for the legislation at the time or did you run from it as your... Well, the legislation party? passed, but it has no support. In essence, it couldn't pass in the House. It will never pass in the United States until we secure the border, and it's not the way we're going to do it when I'm president. When I am president, we are going to, we are going to enforce the law first, prove to people that illegal immigration is under control, and then we'll see what the American people are willing to support when it comes to people that are not criminals, who have been in this country for a long time, and who otherwise would like to stay. Governor Christie? Yeah, yeah, David, I'd just like you to, to listen again, everybody. This is the difference between being a governor who actually has to be responsible for problems and not answering a question. The question was, did he fight for his legislation? It's abundantly clear that he didn't. It's abundantly clear that he didn't fight for the legislation. When the teachers union attacked me with $20 million of ads because I wanted to reform teacher tenure, I fought them and fought them and fought them and I won. When they didn't want, when people wanted to raise taxes in my state, a democratic legislature and threaten to close down the government, I told them, fine. Close down the government, I'll get in my cars, head to the governor's mansion, order a pizza, open a beer and watch the Mets. You can call me when the government reopens. And guess what they didn't do? They didn't pass a tax increase because I vetoed it and they never closed the government because they knew I would fight for what I believed in. The fact of the matter is a leader must fight for what they believe in, not handicap it and say, well, maybe since I can't win this one, I'll run. That's not what leadership is. That's what Congress is. Governor, but thank I you. Senator Rubio. Leadership, leadership is ultimately about solving the problem. And the approach that was tried and has been tried now repeatedly over 10 years to do this comprehensively all at once in a massive piece of legislation has no chance of passage. It is not leadership to continue to try something that has no chance of happening. I want to make progress on this issue. It has been discussed now for 30 years and nothing ever happens. And I am telling you that the only way forward on this issue that has any chance of happening, meaning gaining the support of the American people, you cannot do this without the support of the American people, is an approach that begins by proving that once and for all, illegal immigration is under control. Senator Rubio, thank you. We want to turn to health care in this country, and for that, author and commentator Mary Catherine Hamm tonight. Mary Catherine? Thanks, David. Good evening, guys. Good evening. Mr. Trump. Yes. In the Democratic primary, Hillary Clinton has criticized Bernie Sanders' plan for single-payer government health care, noting it would require big, across-the-board tax increases for Americans. In doing so, she's doubling down on Obamacare, despite its persistent unpopularity. Mr. Trump, you have said you want to repeal Obamacare. You've also said, quote, everybody's got to be covered, adding, quote, the government's going to pay for it. Are you closer to Bernie Sanders' vision for health care than Hillary Clinton is? I don't Clinton think is? I am. I think I'm closer to common sense. Uh, we are going to repeal Obamacare. We are going to repeal Obamacare. We are going to replace Obamacare with something so much better. And there are so many examples of it. And I will tell you, part of the reason we have some people laughing because you have insurance people that take care of everybody up here. I'm a self-funder. The only one they're not taking care of is me. We have our lines around each state. The insurance companies are getting rich on Obamacare. The insurance companies are getting rich on health care and health services and everything having to do with health. We're going to end that. We're going to take out the artificial boundaries, the artificial lines. We're going to get a plan where people compete. Free enterprise, they compete so much better. 
In addition, in addition to that, in addition to that, you have the health care savings plans, which are excellent. What I do say is there will be a certain number of people that will be on the street dying. And as a Republican, I don't want that to happen. We're going to take care of people that are dying on the street because there will be a group of people that are not going to be able to even think in terms of private or anything else. And we're going to take care of those people. And I think everybody on this stage would have to agree, you're not going to let people die sitting in the middle of a street in any city in this country. Senator Cruz. To that point, uh, Mr. Trump has said that your position on health care means that maybe you've got, quote, no heart. Uh, there is a question here, though, about uncovered folks. You suggested repealing and replacing Obamacare as we learned with President Obama's broken promise that everyone could keep their plan. Any major plan change in health care policy carries with it the risk that some people will lose their insurance coverage or have to change it. How do you reassure those people that repealing and replacing Obamacare is still in their best interest? Well, let me take two different parts of that. Let me start with socialized medicine. Socialized medicine is a disaster. It does not work. If you look at the countries that have imposed socialized medicine, that have put the government in charge of providing medicine, what inevitably happens is rationing. You have a scarcity of doctors, you have rationing, and that means the elderly are told, we're going to ration a hip replacement, we're going to ration a knee replacement, we're going to ration end-of-life care. We're right now heading into a medical system with about a 90,000 doctor shortage in America, and socialized medicine, whether proposed by the Democrats or proposed by a Republican, would hurt the people of this country. What should we do on health care? If I'm elected president, we will repeal every word of Obamacare. And once we do that, we will adopt common sense reforms. Number one, we'll allow people to purchase health insurance across state lines that will drive down prices and, and expand the availability of low-cost catastrophic insurance. We'll expand health savings accounts, and we will delink health insurance from employment so that you don't lose your health insurance when you lose your job. And that way, health insurance can be personal, portable, and affordable, and we keep government from getting in between us and our doctors. Dr. Carson, you have some experience with this matter. In the past, you have said that Obamacare should be replaced before it's repealed. How and why? Well, thank you. Uh, you know, I was hoping to get a chance to talk about North Korea. I was the only one who didn't get to do that. And I got some stuff to say about it, let me tell you. But at any rate, uh, at you have to replace it with something that makes sense. It doesn't make sense. And the reason that I dislike Obamacare is because the government comes in and it tells the people which the nation is supposed to be centered on, that we don't care what you think. This is what we're doing. If you don't like it, too bad. That's a problem. And we can't afford to do that because that will fundamentally change America. I have proposed a health empowerment account system. Everybody gets a health empowerment account the day they are born. They keep it until they die. They can pass it on. We pay for it with the same dollars that we pay for traditional health care with, recognizing that we spend twice as much as many countries per capita on health care and don't have as much access. We give people the ability to shift money within their health empowerment account uh, so that uh, each family basically becomes its own insurance company without a middleman. That saves you an awful lot of money. And uh, that will lower the cost of your catastrophic insurance tremendously because the only thing coming out of that is catastrophic health care. And then in terms of taking care of the indigent, we have another whole system. And I, I can go ahead and explain it, uh, but I don't have the time. But I'd be happy to if you give me some more time. But go to my website, bencarson.com, read about it. You can read about everything that's been discussed here in great detail. Thank you, Dr. Carson. David and Martha, back to you. Mary Catherine, thank you. We want to turn now to the issue of eminent domain, which is being debated right here in New Hampshire. And Josh McKelvin is the political director, the anchor of WMUR-TV. Josh. Thank you, David, and good evening, candidates. Mr. Trump, you have said, quote, I love eminent domain, which is the seizure of private property for the sake of the greater good, theoretically. You've tried to use the measure in business endeavors. You've said you'd support its use for the Keystone Pipeline Project. Here in New Hampshire, a project, though, known as the Northern Pass, would bring hydroelectric power from Canada into the northeastern grid. Do 
do you see eminent domain as an appropriate tool to get that project done? Well, well let me just tell you about eminent domain because almost all of these people, actually Chris has it, but so many people have hit me with commercials and other things about eminent domain. Eminent domain is an absolute necessity for a country, for our country. Without it, you wouldn't have roads, you wouldn't have hospitals, you wouldn't have anything. You wouldn't have schools, you wouldn't have bridges. You need eminent domain. And a lot of the big conservatives that tell me how conservative they are, I think I'm more than they are, they tell me, oh, well, they all want the Keystone Pipeline. The Keystone Pipeline without eminent domain, it wouldn't go 10 feet, okay? You need eminent domain. And eminent domain is a good thing, not a bad thing. And what a lot of people don't know, because they were all saying, oh, you're gonna take their property. When somebody, when eminent domain is used on somebody's property, that person gets a fortune. They get at least fair market value, and if they're smart, they'll get two or three times the value of their property. But without eminent domain, you don't have roads, highways, schools, bridges, or anything. So eminent domain, it's not that I love it, but eminent domain is absolutely, it's a necessity for a country, and certainly it's a necessity for our country. So Josh, would that be yes on the Northern Pass project? Yes, the difference, the, difference, yes, yes, yes. the difference between eminent domain for public purpose, as Donald said, roads and infrastructure, pipelines and all that, that's for public purpose. <laughs> what Donald Trump did was use eminent domain to try to take the property of an elderly woman on the strip in Atlantic City. That is not public purpose. That is downright wrong. Take and here's the problem with that. The problem was it was to Jim, tear down. It was to Jim tear wants down. To be, he wants to be a tough guy. Down, he wants to be a tough guy tonight. It was to tear down I didn't the take house, the property. And the net I, result I didn't, was you tried. I didn't and take you the lost property. In the, court. the woman ultimately didn't want to do that. I that is not away, true. And, and the it was simple fact that I is didn't. to turn this into a limousine parking lot for his casinos is not a public use. And in Florida, based on what we did, we made that impossible. It is part of our constitution. That's the better approach. That is the conservative approach. Mr. Trump, take 30 seconds. Well, let, let me just, you know, he wants to be a tough guy. A lot of times, you'll have, you'll have, and, and it doesn't work very well with How that. tough is it a to lot take of times, property from you, an elderly talk, woman? Let me talk, quiet. How tough is it? A lot of it? times, a lot of times, that's all of his donors and special interests <laughs> out there. So, that's what it is. That's what, and by the way, let me just tell you, we needed tickets, you can't get them. You know who has the tickets for the, I'm talking about to the television audience? Donors, special interest, the people that are putting up the money. So it is, the RNC told us we have all donors in the audience and the reason they're not loving me, the reason they're not, excuse me, the reason they're not loving me is I don't want their money. I'm going to do the right thing for the American public. I don't want their money. I don't need their money. And I'm the only one up here that can say that. Eminent domain, the Keystone Pipeline, do you consider that a private job? I you, consider, you consider it a public that, use. No, no, let me ask you, Jeb. Do you consider the Keystone Pipeline use. private? It's is it public, public or private? It's a public use. Oh, really? A, a public use? No, yeah. it's a private job. It's a public it's use. It's a private Established job. Established by the courts, federal, state you courts. You wouldn't have the Keystone Pipeline that you want so badly without eminent domain. All right, exactly. You I wouldn't agree. have massive, excuse me, Josh, you wouldn't have massive factories without eminent domain. Gentlemen, we do have to move forward. Dave, Martha, back Josh, to you. Thank you. When we come back here tonight, jobs, ISIS, and what it means to be a conservative.